The riots turned bloody as Cossacks tried to quell the unrest. Eventually, the bloodshed culminated in a pogrom against the city's Jewish population, with hundreds dying. Attempts by the rest of the Black Sea Fleet to sink the Potemic failed, and eventually, through want of supplies, the crew surrendered the ship to the Romanian government at the port of Constanta. Later, after a series of negotiations, the Romanian government returned the ship to Russian officials. Between June 21st and June 25th, there was an armed insurrection of workers in the Polish city of Lodz. Police and soldiers were killed as barricades were manned throughout the city. Over 3,000 armed militia took part in the uprising, but after four days, it was crushed by a military force of over six infantry regiments. Official reports detailed 151 deaths and 150 wounded, but some unofficial reports claim as many as 2,000 casualties in the brutal street fighting that involved rioters throwing sulfuric acid onto troops. Strikes continued in Poland, as well as the Baltics and in the Caucasus. The Georgian Marxist leader, No Jordania, recalled, the whole administrative apparatus fell into confusion. A de facto freedom of assembly, strike, and demonstration was established. The U.S. consul in Odessa wrote that, All classes condemn the authorities and most particularly the emperor. The present ruler has lost absolutely the affection of the Russian people. A Russian police insider described how, the chaos was all-encompassing, and that the efforts of the police had ground to a halt. The governor of Kiraisi in the Caucasus turned revolutionary whilst the governors of Kazan and Poltava had nervous breakdowns. Many peasants refused to pay taxes, and over 2,000 manor homes were damaged or destroyed. Governor Ivan Bloch of the city of Samara described his situation. You risk your life, you wear out your nerves maintaining order so that people can live like human beings, and what do you encounter everywhere? Hate-filled glances as if you were some kind of monster, a drinker in human blood. Governor Block was assassinated a year later. After being decapitated by a bomb, his mangled body was stuffed into a dress uniform for the funeral, and a large ball of cotton wool replaced his head for the occasion. The newspaper Rus published that, Those guilty of Russia's disgrace should be overwhelmed with shame. The death of half a million men and the loss of billions of money is the cost of the rejection of progress and Western civilization. Sevastopol and the Crimean War struck the shackles from the serfs, and Port Arthur, Mukden, and Tsushima should free Russia from the slavery of the bureaucracy. Tsar Nicholas wrote in his diary, It makes me sick to read the news. If Russia and Japan were going to talk peace, they would first have to sit at the same table, and for that to happen, a neutral third party was needed to invite them there. This neutral third party turned out to be the United States of America. Britain was allied with Japan. France was allied with Russia. The Ottoman Empire had boxed in the Russian Black Sea Fleet, and Germany, possessing interests in China, had interned Russian ships and supplied coal to the Second Pacific Fleet. During the war, the United States had remained officially neutral, although American banks did help to fund the Japanese war effort, and 
the U.S. held interests in the Pacific with Hawaii, as well as the Philippines, and pursuing the open-door policy in China. American diplomatic efforts would be orchestrated by the U.S. President, Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was born in 1858 to a wealthy and established family and had been racked by health problems as a child, but eventually studied at Harvard and was an avid historian and naturalist. He was New York City Police Commissioner in 1894 and then Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1897. He then stepped down from his prominent position in the government to volunteer to fight in the Spanish-American War in 1898, and upon his return, became vice president in 1900. He was the youngest president to take office, aged 42, following the assassination of President William McKinley in 1901, and was 46 in 1905. Roosevelt believed strongly in the export of American power abroad, inheriting the Philippine-American War, which ended in 1902, and following an American-endorsed revolution in Colombia in 1904, obtained the rights for the Panama Canal. He was famed for using the expression, speak softly and carry a big stick, to express his foreign policy. Diplomatic forethought, backed by a large military. Roosevelt had acted as a mediator between Venezuela, Britain, and Germany between 1902 and 1903, and played a role in preventing the debt crisis from descending into war. Officially, the United States declared neutrality on February 11, 1904, Roosevelt's personal opinion, however, was pro-Japanese, writing, I have done all that I could consistent with international law to advance her interests. I thoroughly admire and believe in the Japanese. When Port Arthur fell, the president wrote, Banzai, how the fur will fly when Nogi joins Oyama. And when the Japanese fleet was victorious at Tsushima, he told a Japanese representative, Every Japanese, but perhaps above all every Japanese naval man, must feel as if he was treading on air today. Later, however, Roosevelt became more sympathetic towards the Russian cause, concerned over the prospect of a collapse of czarism. The president was also further concerned with growing Japanese strength in the Pacific, to which he predicted that, in a dozen years, the English, Americans, and Germans, who now dread one another as rivals in the trade of the Pacific, will have each to dread the Japanese more than they do any other nations. I believe that Japan will take its place as a great civilized power of a formidable type. Later, the president would tell Jean Jusserand, the French ambassador to the United States, I would like to see the war ending with Russia and Japan locked in a clink, counterweighting one another, and both kept weak by the effort. Roosevelt then noted his thoughts on a peace conference and the American position to American ambassador to Russia, George Meyer. I am not inclined to think that Tokyo will show itself a particle more altruistic than St. Petersburg. For years, Russia has pursued a policy of consistent opposition to us in the East. It has been impossible to trust any promise she has made. On the other hand, Japan's diplomatic statements have been made good, yet Japan is an Oriental nation, and the individual standard of truthfulness in Japan is low. No one can foretell her future attitude. We must, therefore, play our hand alone. On March 20th, 1905, ten days following the Battle of Mukden, Roosevelt announced his willingness to act as mediator, telling the Japanese government that the U.S. could offer, in the event of discussions, 
helpful offices. While there were murmurings of peace in Manchuria, war loomed in Europe. The status of Morocco had led to a diplomatic dispute between France and Germany, referred to as the First Moroccan Crisis. On March 31, 1905, German Kaiser Wilhelm II visited the Moroccan city of Tangier, in which he convened with representatives of the Sultan. Wilhelm announced his support of Moroccan sovereignty in accordance with the 1880 Madrid Conference. This was seen, as many, as a challenge to French power in North Africa. Sultan Abdelaziz subsequently rejected French-backed government reforms and invited the major powers to an international conference while both France and Germany braced for the possibility of war. Eventually, a compromise was reached amongst the powers wherein Morocco would remain in the French sphere of influence, but the French foreign minister, Theophile de Classe, was forced to resign. Until the compromise in the following year in March 1906, tensions remained high in Europe. On April 8th, the Japanese government agreed amongst themselves on the general peace terms they would demand if there were to be talks. On April 21st, the peace terms were officially approved. By mid-April, Britain intended to support French claims in North Africa in accordance with Anglo-French rapprochement with the Entente Cordiale signed the previous year. April 25, 1905, saw Japanese Foreign Minister Komura Jitaro send a telegram to Takahira Kagoro, the Japanese ambassador to the United States. You are hereby instructed to convey to the President through the Secretary of War cordial thanks of the Imperial Government for his observation and, at the same time, to declare that Japan adheres to the position of maintaining the open door in Manchuria and of restoring that province to China. Further, you will say that the Imperial Government finding that the views of the President coincide with their own on the subject of direct negotiations, would be highly gratified if he has any views of which he is willing or feels at liberty to give, in order to pave the way for the inauguration of such negotiation. The U.S. Secretary of War, William Taft, went on to tell Roosevelt, Japanese Foreign Office says they are anxious to effect peace through you. May 29th saw the Russian 2nd Pacific Squadron destroyed at the Battle of Tsushima. Two days later, on May 31st, Japanese diplomats asked President Roosevelt to, directly and entirely of his own motion and initiative, invite the two belligerents to come together for the purpose of direct negotiation. Roosevelt then met with Arthur Cassini, the Russian ambassador to the United States, and asked him to send a message to the Tsar, which said that if Nicholas agreed to a peace conference, the president would be able to get Japan to come to the table. Roosevelt also described the military situation as absolutely hopeless for Russia. In addition to contacting Ambassador Cassini, Roosevelt ordered the American ambassador in St. Petersburg, George Meyer, to meet with the Tsar in person and deliver the same sentiments of hopeless war and possible peace. On June 5th, Tsar Nicholas was out of the city about to celebrate Tsarina Alexandra's 33rd birthday on June 6th when Meyer requested an audience with the Tsar he was initially denied, as Nicholas did not receive diplomats during family events. President Roosevelt wrote to American Secretary of State John Hay, Did you ever know anything more pitiable than the condition of the Russian despotism in this year of grace? The Tsar is a preposterous little creature. 
as the absolute autocrat of 150 million people. He is unable to make war, and he is now unable to make peace. Meyer, however, pleaded his case, stating that the Tsarina's birthday was not until tomorrow, that he would take a train at once, and emphasizing that the message was directly from the president to the Tsar. Eventually, he was given permission to meet with Nicholas, and they did so the next day, on June 6th, at 2 p.m. At first, Mayer paraphrased Roosevelt's thinking, to which the Tsar responded that he needed time to ascertain what his people really wanted. In response, Mayer directly read from the president's cable. It is the judgment of all outsiders, including all of Russia's most ardent friends, that the present contest is absolutely hopeless and that to continue it would only result in the loss of all of Russia's possessions in East Asia. To avert trouble, and as he fears what is otherwise inevitable disaster, the present most earnestly advises that an effort be made by representatives of the two powers to discuss the whole peace question themselves, rather than for any outside power to do more than endeavor to arrange the meeting, that is, to ask both powers whether they will not consent to meet. Mayer continued as the Tsar listened in silence. If Russia will consent to such a meeting, the president will try to get Japan's consent, acting simply on his own initiative and not saying that Russia has consented. Mayer was unaware that Japan had already requested the meeting. And the president believes he will succeed. Russia's answer to this request will be kept strictly secret, as will all that has so far transpired, nothing being made public until Japan also agrees. The president will then openly ask each power to agree to the meeting, which can thereupon be held. As to the place of the meeting, the president would suggest some place between Harbin and Mukden, but this is a mere suggestion. The president earnestly hopes for a speedy and favorable answer to avert bloodshed and calamity. Mayor finished reading and Nicholas continued to sit in silence. The ambassador continued to make appeals, but Nicholas supposedly only responded with emotion when replying to one of Mayer's claims that if Japan proved stubborn or greedy at the conference table, Russians would unite behind their czar. Nicholas replied, That is my belief, and I think you are absolutely right. As it almost turned three o'clock, the czar concluded the meeting. If it will be... Absolutely secret as to my decision, should Japan decline, or until she gives her consent. I will now commit to your president's plan. Do you suppose that President Roosevelt knows, or could find out in the meantime, and let us know, what Japan's terms are? On June 8, 1905, President Roosevelt formally invited the Imperial Russian government and the Imperial Japanese government to meet for a peace conference. The president feels that the time has come when, in the interests of all mankind, he must endeavor to see if it is not possible to bring to an end the terrible and lamentable conflict now being waged. On June 10th, the Imperial Japanese government formally accepted the invitation. On June 12th, the Imperial Russian government formally accepted the invitation. The news that Japan had accepted peace talks two days before Russia signified a loss of face for Japan and marked a less than perfect start to negotiations. On the day both countries officially accepted to meet, the secret negotiations were made public to the press. The British newspaper Morning Post remarked, as a diplomatist, Mr. Roosevelt is now entitled to take high rank 
On July 1, 1905, the American Secretary of State, John Hay, died from heart complications. Around the same time, the United States Secretary of War, William Taft, had left for San Francisco, from which he would embark on a tour of Asia. These two events left Roosevelt with a large amount of personal influence on the American conduct during negotiations. With the Battle of Tsushima over and peace talks having begun, the fourth and final international loan was issued to Japan. On July 4th, Japan was issued with another 30 million pounds, a present-day value of over $3.6 billion, again with an interest rate of 4.5% over 25 years. Most of the capital came from Britain and America. However, a large portion of the final loan also came from Germany. In an effort to strengthen their position for the upcoming talks, on July 7th, Japanese forces invaded Sakhalin Island. At the time, the island had a population of roughly 30,000, mostly Russian settlers and convicts, as well as 4,000 native Ainu and Gilyak inhabitants. Russian resources had been prioritized for the Manchurian theater, and the Japanese Navy's superiority at sea meant the Russian military presence on Sakhalin was minimal. All in all, the Russian garrison consisted of 7,280 troops, most of them locally recruited conscripts and led by General Mikhail Lyapunov, a military lawyer before the war. The Japanese landing force was made up of the newly formed 13th Division, with 14,000 troops under General Haraguchi Kinsai, and a naval force of eight cruisers, four coastal defense ships, nine destroyers, and 12 torpedo boats under Vice Admiral Diwa Shigeto. The Japanese forces began landing in the south of the island on July 7th and found no resistance. There was fighting in the town of Korsakov, and the defense held for 17 hours. Eventually, the 2,000 Russian troops withdrew, but only after burning the town down. On July 10th, the settlement of Vladimirakova was occupied and new Japanese detachments landed. Colonel Arkazuski prepared for further defensive battles, but upon realizing the outflanking Japanese forces, retreated into the mountains. He later surrendered on July 16th, with 200 Russian troops being taken prisoner. After 18 Japanese troops had been killed, and 58 wounded. July 24th saw fresh Japanese landings in the north of the island near Alexandrovsk Sakhalinsky. In response, General Lyapunov surrendered his force of 5,000 troops on July 31st. Around 181 Russian soldiers died in the fighting and 3,270 taken prisoner. By August 7th, the entire island was occupied by Japanese forces. Sakhalin was the first instance of Russian territory being lost to Japan during the war, and its occupation further threatened the city of Vladivostok. On July 24th, a meeting took place in the Gulf of Finland between Tsar Nicholas II of Russia and Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. The two met in secret, having arrived in their summer yachts. They met to discuss and sign the Treaty of Bjorko, the basics of a Russo-German alliance. The treaty contained four articles and was signed by both the emperors and Heinrich von Tchirtsky, the head of the German Foreign Office and Russian Naval Minister Alexei Birilev. The article stated that if one country was attacked by a European power, that the other would join the war, that they would not conclude a separate peace with the warring party, that the treaty would come into effect following peace with Japan, and that Russia 
would attempt to persuade France to join the alliance. Despite being signed by the emperors, the treaty still required ratification by the respective governments. The secret dealings caused massive shocks throughout both governments, principally in Russia. A Russo-German alliance was seen as a betrayal and counterintuitive to the already established Franco-Russian alliance. Russian Foreign Minister Lambsdorff told the Tsar that it was inadmissible to promise at the same time the same thing to two governments whose interests were mutually antagonistic. Pressured from the government, the Tsar signed a letter drafted by Sergei Witte that stated that unless France joined the alliance, that Russia would have to maintain the commitments to France at the expense of those recently promised to Germany. The German Reich Chancellor Bernhard von Bülow also threatened to resign after his understanding that the pact was to be global in nature, not just confined to Europe. Eventually, things fell apart and the Russo-German alliance was abandoned. The debacle did, however, further strengthen the Entente Cordiale between France and Britain. After setting off earlier in the month, American Secretary of War William Taft and the President's daughter Alice Roosevelt, as well as 30 American congressmen, on their way to the Philippines, landed in Tokyo on July 25th. On July 27th, Taft and the Japanese Prime Minister Katsura Taro dined together and spoke of international security in Asia and the Pacific. By the end, they had agreed on a memorandum of conversation. The talks were informal in nature and reflected personal influence more than government policy. Taft, speaking for Roosevelt, wanted assurances from Katsura that Japan had no plans for Hawaii or the Philippines in future years. In exchange, Katsura wanted America to recognize Japanese supremacy in Korea, stating that the peninsula was the direct cause of the war and that Japanese acquisition of it was the logical consequence. Katsura stated Japan's only interest in the Philippines was to see it governed by a strong and friendly nation like the United States. Responding in kind, Taft stated, President Roosevelt would concur with Japanese views on Korea, however that the president could not nullify the Joseon United States Treaty of 1882 that promised perpetual peace and friendship between the United States and Korea, and that if other powers deal unjustly or oppressively with either government, the other will exert their good offices. In Roosevelt's opinion, Korea would be better off as a Japanese colony than either a Chinese or Russian one, and the exchange would also secure the Philippines and Hawaii. The development of Korea along Japanese lines would also create an immigrant market for Japanese workers, thereby decreasing the number of Japanese immigrating to the United States. A point of contention in California the agreement would also improve U.S.-Japanese relations for the upcoming peace conference and, in turn, increase American influence over events. By July, the diplomatic pace picked up. Both Russia and Japan appointed their full delegations and confided in the American president their possible concessions. It was also announced that the conference would take place on American territory. Washington was deemed unsuitable, with the summer heat and humidity acting counterproductive to the cooling down of tensions. The decision was made for the conference to take place at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, a small coastal city in the northeastern United States. Portsmouth fit Roosevelt's desire for some cool, comfortable, and retired place 
and contained the necessary communications and security infrastructure for an international conference. The delegations of the Russian Empire and the Empire of Japan to the Portsmouth Peace Conference consisted of a single senior diplomat, a single deputy diplomat, six advisors from economic, diplomatic, and military backgrounds, and a number of clerical and security staff. For Japan, the role of deputy diplomat was to be filled by Kogoro Takahira, the Japanese ambassador to the United States. Kogoro Takahira was born in 1858 in Iwate in northern Japan and would be adopted by the academic and Ikmaseki clan retainer, Mato Takahira. Kogoro studied at the Ikmaseki clan school and later graduated from the predecessor to Tokyo University. He would first enter the Ministry of Industry, but later changed and joined the Foreign Ministry in 1876. Between 1879 and 1881, Takahira would serve as a diplomatic attaché to the United States. Upon his return, he would be given postings in Korea and the Japanese consulate in Shanghai. From 1882, the majority of his roles would be in Europe, firstly in Italy, but later in the Netherlands, Denmark, Switzerland, and Austria-Hungary. Given his embedded position in European politics, he played a role in forming the Japanese response to the triple power intervention over the Laodong Peninsula in 1895. In 1887, he again moved to America and was made the Japanese Consul General in New York. In 1899, he became the Japanese Deputy Foreign Minister, and a year later, in 1900, served as the Japanese Ambassador to the United States, a position he would hold throughout the war with Russia. Takahira helped secure American neutrality during the fighting, as well as a favorable American disposition through acts such as aiding the American Red Cross and allowing American doctors and nurses such as Anita McGee to serve in Japanese hospitals and prisoner of war camps. He would be 51 years old when appointed the Japanese deputy diplomat to the Portsmouth Peace Conference in 1905. Russia's deputy diplomat was to be Roman Rosen, the former Russian minister to Japan. Roman Romanovich Rosen was born in 1847 to a noble family of Swedish and German ancestry in present-day Estonia. He graduated from the University of Dorpat and later the Imperial Academy of Law. Rosen joined the Russian Foreign Ministry's Asia Department and became head of the Japanese Bureau by 1875. That same year, he helped draft the Treaty of St. Petersburg, which resulted in Russia's acquiring all of Sakhalin Island and Japan relinquishing its territory there in exchange for the Kuril Island chain. He was then made first secretary at the Russian legation, in Yokohama, a position he would maintain for eight years until 1883. Rosen was then appointed Russian Consul General in New York in 1884, and then as a diplomat in Washington from 1886 until 1889. In 1891, he established the first Russian legation in Mexico City, staying as Russian First Minister to Mexico until 1893, when he was appointed the Russian ambassador to Serbia, during which he would contribute to the Russo-Austrian Agreement of 1897, wherein both powers saw to maintain the status quo in the Balkans. In 1897, Rosen returned to Japan as the Russian minister, and a year later negotiated the Nishi-Rosen Agreement which saw Japan recognize Russian Laodong and Russia recognize Japanese economic rights in Korea. He was then recalled and served in Germany and Greece 
He returned to Tokyo as Russian minister to Japan again in April 1903 and led Russian negotiations during the build-up to war. Rosen had wished to avoid conflict. However, his attempts to cool tensions were seen as alarmist in St. Petersburg and ineffective in Tokyo. Rosen left Japan after the severing of diplomatic relations at the start of the war and was appointed the Russian ambassador to the United States, replacing Arthur Cassini in May 1905. The senior diplomat assigned the task of ending the war for Japan was Jutaro Kamura, the Japanese Minister of Foreign Affairs. Kamura was born in 1855, the son of an Obi clan samurai in Miyazaki. Kamura studied law at the predecessor to Tokyo University following the Meiji Revolution and went on to graduate from Harvard Law School in 1878. In 1880, he entered the Ministry of Justice and served as a Supreme Court judge. In 1884, he then transferred to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In 1893, Kimura became head of the Japanese legation in Peking during the lead-up to the First Sino-Japanese War. In 1895, he helped draft the Peace Treaty of Shimonoseki with its large Chinese concessions Kimura replaced Miura Goro as Japanese minister to Korea following the assassination of the Korean Empress Myung Song in 1895, and, as Korean minister, negotiated the Kimura Weber Memorandum, a precursor to the Nishi Rosen Agreement, which sought to regulate Russian and Japanese troop numbers in Korea. Kimura became Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and Ambassador to the United States in 1898. In 1901, he was made Japanese Minister of Foreign Affairs. As Foreign Minister, he signed the Boxer Protocol on behalf of Japan, ending the Boxer Uprising in China against the Eight-Nation Alliance of Foreign Powers. He would also help forge the Anglo-Japanese Alliance a year later, in 1902. Kimura's negotiating style was described by a contemporary as apprehensive, lest somebody might get the better of him. The senior Russian diplomat was to be Sergei Witte, the former finance minister. Sergei Witte was born in Tifli in present-day Georgia in 1849. His father descended from Baltic Swedish Lutherans and had converted to orthodoxy upon marrying Witta's mother. Witta came from mid-ranking family and studied mathematical science at university in Odessa in the Ukraine and graduated top of his class. Witta entered the regional civil service in 1871 where he administered the local railways as well as joining the Southwestern Railway Company. His work made the railways profitable and, during the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78, his efficiency in the transport of men and material was noted by St. Petersburg higher-ups. And, in 1879, he accepted a position in the capital. By 1886, he was manager of the Southwestern Railway Company. In 1888, the Borky train disaster occurred in which a train carrying the imperial family derailed at high speed. Tsar Alexander III and the imperial family survived. However, 21 lives were lost. In its aftermath, Witta was appointed director of the newly established railroad department. He was later promoted to transportation minister, and in 1892, in the aftermath of famine, he became Russian Minister of Finance. From a relatively speaking low social background, his Ukrainian accent and his wife's Jewish faith, a source of gossip amongst aristocracy, he was largely dismissed as an upstart merchant. However, on account of his logistical talent, he was protected by the Tsar. Witte thought of himself as a Russian Bismarck, 
and was the dominant figure in the government with his policies defining the period. He attempted to force march Russian industrialization through acquiring French and German capital and establishing government monopolies, such as the one on vodka. He also promoted social monarchy, wherein the Tsar would implement social welfare to appease the masses. Perhaps his largest achievement was the Trans-Siberian Railway, which was largely completed thanks to his efforts. He also constructed the southern branches of the railway through Manchuria and sought railway expansion into China as a means of peaceful penetration. Witta wished to avoid conflict with Japan and was the de facto head of the peace party, although it should be noted that despite his desire for peace, he was complicit in Russian eastern expansion. By August 1903, he had lost the Tsar's faith, having been defeated by the Bezobrazov Circle, and was promoted to the post of Chair of the Committee of Ministers, a ceremonial role that amounted to exclusion. After two unsuccessful candidates and pressure from Witta supporters in the government, the Tsar finally appointed Sergei Witta as the senior Russian diplomat to the Portsmouth Peace Conference. He stood above most, at almost six foot six inches tall, and saw the world of diplomacy largely through an economic lens. The contemporary historian Henry Adams described Witta from a meeting a few years before the conference. He is a force, a rather brute energy, a Peter the Great sort of earnestness. Upon his appointment as senior diplomat to the peace conference, Witta wrote to Russian finance minister Kokovstov, When a sewer has to be cleaned, they send Witta, but as soon as work of a nicer kind appears, other candidates spring up. Before the conference took place, the Japanese delegates Kamura and Takahira paid a visit to Roosevelt's personal residence, Sagamore Hill in New York. Roosevelt spoke of his worry that Japan might ask for too much. The Japanese diplomats informed the president of their initial demands. Russia should recognize Japanese supremacy in Korea. Russia should withdraw all troops from Manchuria and relinquish its transport and trade in the region. Russia should pay an indemnity, cash compensation, to Japan for the financial cost of the war. Japan should acquire the Laodong Peninsula, Sakhalin Island, and the Port Arthur Railway. Russia should be prevented from maintaining a large navy in the Far East. Russian warships in neutral ports should be surrendered to Japan. Japanese nationals should be given fishing rights along the Siberian coast, and the forts surrounding Vladivostok should be dismantled. Roosevelt also informed the delegates that he had heard from a French source that the Russians were going to be unwilling to pay for an indemnity, and advised the Japanese to approach the principal first before demanding specific figures. Kamura did not object to Roosevelt's comments, but insisted that Japan had the right to compensation. After Kamura and Takahira had left, Roosevelt received further information from his French contact that Witta would consider paying at least part of Japan's expenses in the war, but had vowed that he would break off the peace conference within ten days if Japan refused to make concessions. Witta and Rosen visited the president's home at a later date, August 4th. Having attended an Orthodox church service in Manhattan, on account of it being the name day of Empress Marie Fedorovna, Tsar Nicholas's mother, when they left the church, the priest gave a departing message. May God help you and grant you wisdom. Just now, we all feel lost and do not know what to do or what the future will bring. Witta and Rosen were torn 
Russia had been beaten militarily. However, it had not been conquered, and had the men and material to continue the war if necessary, a fact repeatedly emphasized by Tsar Nicholas. Yet, there was also major discontent within Russia. A slow revolution and peace with Japan would allow the Tsarist state to focus entirely on these domestic issues. Japan had also recently invaded Sakhalin, Russia's first territorial loss of the conflict. A fatalistic attitude developed as the diplomats seemed to be assigned the task of saving the Tsar's empire. At the same time, the two sensed weakness in the opposing party, with the suspicions that Japan had pressed for the conference first, not Roosevelt. The Russian diplomats were described as one man with one mind, one will and one heart beating for our country. The Russian diplomats and the American president dined and talked for two hours. Witta stated, We are not conquered and can therefore accept no conditions which are not suitable to our position. Consequently, first of all, we shall not agree to pay any indemnity. Witta presented a letter from Tsar Nicholas allowing for some concessions. Russia would recognize Japanese rights in Korea and transfer the Laodong Peninsula to Japan upon Chinese assent. Witta went on to insist that Russia's interior condition was serious but not such as it is thought to be abroad. The Russian diplomats stated they were willing to negotiate on territories lost in the fighting, but if Japan continually insisted upon larger concessions, that we shall carry on a defensive war to the last extremity, and we shall see who will hold out the longest. Roosevelt responded, stating his belief that peace was in the best interest of both parties, and, if it came to it, Russia should pay an indemnity as a last resort. That evening, both Kimura and Takahira and Witta and Rosen headed back to New York. Witta cabled Vladimir Lambsdorff, the Russian foreign minister, that he believed it was clear that the president had as very little hope of a peace treaty, and he therefore expresses the opinion that it is necessary in any case to arrange matters in such a manner that, in the future, when either of the parties wishes it, it will be possible to begin negotiations anew without difficulty. Later, Roosevelt sent two cruisers to New York to pick up the Russian and Japanese delegations and bring them separately to Oyster Bay, near the president's personal home of Sagamore Hill. At around noon on August 5, 1905, cannons fired in salute to the American president arriving aboard the presidential yacht, the USS Mayflower. Shortly after a second round of cannons were heard, marking the arrival of the Japanese delegation aboard. Soon after, a third salute announced the arrival of the Russian delegation. Since Komura and Takahira had arrived in the United States first, they were led down to the yacht's lower deck, where they were greeted by President Roosevelt and led to a large waiting room. Witta and Rosen were then led into the reception hall, also on the lower deck. After greeting Witta and Rosen, Roosevelt informed them that he would like to introduce the Japanese diplomats. The door to the reception room opened and 15 members of the Japanese delegation entered. One observer noted how completely expressionless everyone's faces were during this moment. Then Roosevelt spoke up. Baron Kamura, I have the honor to present you Mr. Witta and Baron Rosen. The delegates then shook hands and stood across from one another in awkward silence. Roosevelt then began urging the delegates to head to the adjacent dining room where a buffet was prepared. Only a few chairs were available 
as to encourage mingling amongst the delegates. The president then asked, Mr. Witta, will you come to lunch with Baron Kimura? And the two sides entered the dining room together. There was cold food and wine available to help combat the summer heat. A few chairs in the corner allowed the president to talk to delegates, while Chinese waiters, substituting for the Mayflower's regular Japanese staff, served the room. At one point, Roosevelt stood and raised his voice. Gentlemen, I propose a toast to which there will be no answer, and which I ask you to drink in silence, standing. I drink to the welfare and prosperity of the sovereigns and to the peoples of the two great nations whose representatives have met one another on this ship. It is my earnest hope and prayer in the interest not only of these two great powers, but of all civilized mankind, that a just and lasting peace may speedily be concluded between them. The delegates drank to the toast in silence, and when the lunch ended, Roosevelt, Witta, Rosen, Kimura, and Takahira posed for a photograph on the afternoon of August 5th, 1905. At 2.40 p.m., Roosevelt left the Mayflower. Next, the Japanese diplomats moved onto the USS Dolphin, whilst the Russian delegates remained on board the Mayflower, which then hoisted the Russian flag and prepared to sail to Portsmouth. I think we're off to a good start, Roosevelt commented upon his return home. The delegations arrived in Portsmouth on August 8th, 1905. The representatives stayed at the Hotel Wentworth and were ferried to the nearby naval base where the negotiations took place inside the General Stores building. On August 9th, the first negotiating session was held, and the Japanese immediately demanded Russian recognition of Japanese supremacy in Korea. Witta wished for onlookers to see the Russians as more reasonable and was willing to relinquish claims on the Korean peninsula, providing the Manchurian border was not threatened. Before the war, Witta had been against expansion into Korea, and with the Tsar's permission, the first Japanese demand was appeased. On August 12th, during the talks with Russia, the Anglo-Japanese alliance was renewed for another 10 years and was expanded to include Japanese non-interference in India and British recognition of Japanese hedge money in Korea. During the first eight sessions of the Portsmouth Peace Conference, both sides agreed on eight points for peace. Russian recognition of Japanese interests in Korea. Russian and Japanese military evacuation of Manchuria. Manchuria to be restored to China. Chinese economic freedom in Manchuria. Russian leased land in Manchuria to be restored to China. Russia to transfer to Japan the southern section of the South Manchurian Railway, including Port Arthur, the Laodong Peninsula, and regional mining concessions upon Chinese consent. Russia to maintain the northern sections of the Chinese Eastern Railway as far south as Quanchengzi. Russia and Japan to use the railways only for economic and not strategic objectives. Witta's negotiating tactic was to allow concessions on points of relatively little importance. Russia had already agreed to evacuate Manchuria back in 1902. This would allow for staunch Russian opposition to the larger points of contention, namely the Indemnity and Sakhalin Island, as well as show our compliance, so that in case of rupture, the blame should fall on the Japanese. Before the Russian delegation departed, the Tsar gave a report outlining his position. I am ready to terminate by peace a war which I did not want, 
provided the conditions offered us befit the dignity of Russia. I do not consider that we are beaten. Our army is still intact, and I have faith in it. Russia has never paid an indemnity. I shall never consent to this. The last point being underlined three times for emphasis. On August 15th, the question of an indemnity was raised. Witta outright refused, and the Russian delegation did not budge. The Japanese offered to ransom Sakhalin for 130 million pounds. This, too, was denied, with Sakhalin being described as a watchman at our gates. At this impasse, the sessions were postponed. Initially, American public opinion largely supported the Japanese, with crowds greeting Kimura, shouting, Right is right, our compliments to the bravest of the brave. Later, however, despite both sides agreeing to keep negotiations a secret, the Russian and Japanese demands were somehow leaked to the American press. In comparison to the relatively few Russian requests, the long list of Japanese demands made them seem expansionist. Talks began of the so-called Yellow Peril, the massive growth of Asia as a world power and the overthrow of Western dominance. The talks became so widespread, Kimura was forced to make a statement. The so-called Yellow Peril is a creation of the imagination on the part of some interested people in Europe. Not only Japan and China, but the entire civilized world has gained immeasurably from our conflict with Russia. On August 18th, Japanese Baron Kintaro Kaneko, acting as a messenger for Komura, visited Roosevelt's home. He informed the president that the talks were becoming deadlocked over the issues of the indemnity and Sakhalin. Japan had somewhat modified its terms, no longer insisting on the demilitarization of Vladivostok and semantically changing the wording from indemnity to reimbursement. Russia, too, had made a slight concession, allowing for Japanese economic interests on Sakhalin. Roosevelt, despite officially being a neutral third party, merely hosting the talks, decided to personally intervene. That night, the president sent Herbert Pierce, the American third assistant secretary of state, to personally deliver a telegram from Roosevelt to Baron Rosen. Pierce woke Rosen up from his sleep at 2 a.m., telling him he was to meet with the president in the afternoon. The two met while Roosevelt was playing tennis, and the president proposed a solution wherein Sakhalin would be divided in half. Roosevelt believed that ground occupied belonged to the occupiers, and gave the example, We Americans are ensconced at Panama and will not leave. In exchange for half of Sakhalin Island, Russia would pay a sum to Japan. Roosevelt asked if Rosen would relay his opinion to the Tsar as an idea expressed in private conversation. On August 21st, Witte wrote to Russian Foreign Minister Lambsdorff, If it is our desire that in the future America and Europe side with us, we must take Roosevelt's opinion into consideration. Roosevelt then again asked Ambassador Mayer to deliver a personal telegram to Tsar Nicholas. I earnestly ask your majesty to believe in what I am about to say and to advise. I speak as the earnest well-wisher of Russia and give you the advice I should give if I were a Russian patriot and statesman. The Japanese are willing to restore the northern half of Sakhalin to Russia, Russia, of course, in such case, to pay a substantial sum for this surrender of territory and for the return of Russian prisoners. If war is continued, though the financial strain upon Japan would be severe, yet in the end Russia would be shorn of these 
East Siberian provinces, the proposed peace leaves the ancient Russian boundaries absolutely intact. The only change will be that Japan will get that part of Sakhalin which was hers up to 30 years ago. As Sakhalin is an island, it is impossible that the Russians should reconquer it in view of the disaster to their navy. My hope and prayer that your majesty may take this view. Mayor pressed Nicholas on the indemnity, but the Tsar insisted that Russia is not in the position of France in 1870. The Tsar did, however, agree to give a liberal and generous amount to the Japanese for the maintenance of Russian prisoners of war. The amount was later decided at seven million pounds, enough to pay for about seven armored cruisers. In principle, some money would be transferred, but this was nothing compared to the massive war expenses. Finally, the Tsar agreed that Japan could keep the southern half of Sakhalin. August 23rd saw Witta propose that Japan could acquire all of Sakhalin Island in exchange for dropping the claim to an indemnity. This proposal was rejected by Komura. Roosevelt then put pressure on Japan to make concessions, sending a message to Baron Kaneko, who in turn would relay the president's disposition to Kimura. I think I ought to tell you that I hear on all sides a good deal of complaint expressed among the friends of Japan as to the possibility of Japan's continuing the war for a large indemnity. He later went on to say that another year of war would only eat up more money than she could at the end get back from Russia, finally stating, Ethically, it seems to me that Japan owes a duty to the world at this crisis. The civilized world looks to her to make peace. The nations believe in her. Let her show her leadership in matters ethical, no less than matters military. The appeal is made to her in the name of all that is lofty and noble. And to this appeal, I hope she will not be deaf. On August 25th, Kaiser Wilhelm sent a letter to Tsar Nicholas, urging him to accept peace. I got a letter from President Roosevelt. Knowing my interest in the peace conference, he kindly sent me information of the situation and of the points at issue upon which there is a difference of opinion between Japan and Russia, and his proposals for meeting the wishes of both belligerents as far as it is possible. I think his proposals most sensible and practical, and hope that they may come up to your expectations. As far as I can make out, they seem to secure to Russia all the advantages of an honorable peace. But of course, it is for you solely to decide, as you are best able to judge, of the feeling of your countrymen. On that same day, rumors spread that the Russian delegates were collecting their bills in preparation for checking out of their hotel, signaling an end to the talks. Roosevelt wrote to his son that, the Japanese ask too much, but the Russians are ten times worse. Eventually, Witta sensed that the Japanese delegation was desperate for peace. On August 26th, after they had rejected the exchange of Sakhalin Island for the dropping of the indemnity, Witta informed Kimura that the Tsar was being influenced by pro-war factions in the government. By late July, there were 500,000 Russian troops in Manchuria, and General Linnaevich was pressing for a renewed offensive. Witta told Kimura that he was instructed to end negotiations if Japan continued to insist on an indemnity. On August 28th, the Russian representatives began packing their bags under the impression that the day's session was sure to be the last and that the talks would break down. Komura asked that a recess be called, and the session be postponed 24 hours, 
to which Witta agreed. That day, in Tokyo, the Japanese cabinet and three influential jinro, Ito Hirobumi, Yamagata Aritomo, and Inoue Kaoru, met to discuss peace. Yamagata had recently returned from surveying the situation in Manchuria, and was concerned at the number of Russian supplies and fresh army corps that continued to arrive at the front. Later in the day, the Japanese leaders met with Emperor Meiji, and at 8.30 p.m., Foreign Minister Kimura was instructed to abandon the demand for an indemnity and to relinquish claims on Sakhalin if it threatened to end the conference. However, information from the British Foreign Office informed the Japanese that Russia was willing to divide Sakhalin, and so the second point was retracted. On Tuesday, the 29th of August, the delegates met again with the deadlock over indemnities characterized by the incessant smoking of representatives sat in silence across from one another. Kimura opened that he had not received a formal answer from the offer to partition Sakhalin along the 50th parallel in exchange for 1.2 billion yen. Witta replied that Russia was rejecting the offer. Witta then stood up and placed a piece of paper on the table. It was Russia's final offer. They would pay no indemnity, and Sakhalin would be halved. The room was silent, and Komura sat motionless. Witta indulged in his habit of tearing paper apart piece by piece as he sat, waiting. Some time passed, and eventually, Komura stood up. He said, that the Japanese government wished to drop the indemnity, accept the final offer, end negotiations, and restore peace. Witta accepted Kimura's offer, and it was decided that Sakhalin would be divided along the 15th parallel, Russia to the north, Japan to the south. The Russo-Japanese War was over. Some reports claim that Komura wept after Witta left the conference room. When the swarming reporters outside asked the Russian representative, what about the indemnity? Not a penny, Witta replied, as a French reporter shouted, Viva la Russe, and the crowd joined in. At 3.49 p.m. on September 5, 1905, the representatives met to sign the Treaty of Portsmouth. The document stated that, Article 1. There shall henceforth be peace. Article 2. The Imperial Russian government, acknowledging that Japan possesses in Korea paramount political, military, and economical interests. Article 3. To evacuate completely Manchuria, except the territory affected by the lease of the Laotung Peninsula. Article 4. Not to obstruct all countries for the development of the commerce or industry of Manchuria. Article 5. The Imperial Russian government transfers the lease of Port Arthur and Tallinn. Article 6. The Imperial Russian government engages to transfer the railway between Chang Chunfu and Quan Chang Tsu and Port Arthur, as well as the coal mines in said region. Article 7. Japan and Russia to exploit their respective railways in Manchuria exclusively for commercial and industrial purposes. Article 8. Will as soon as possible conclude a separate convention for the regulation of their connecting railway services in Manchuria. Article 9. The Imperial Russian government cedes to the Imperial Government of Japan, the southern portion of the island of Sakhalin. Article 10. 
Russian subjects, inhabitants of the territory ceded to Japan on condition of submitting to the Japanese laws. Article 11. Granting to Japanese subjects rights of fishery along the coasts of Russian possession in the Japan, Okhotsk, and Bering Seas. Article 12. Engaged to adopt a new treaty of commerce and navigation. Article 13. As soon as possible, all prisoners of war shall be reciprocally restored. Article 14. Treaty shall be ratified by their majesties. Article 15. Signed in duplicate in both the English and French languages. And was signed Sergei Witta, R. Rosen, Jutaro Komura, K. Takahira. It had been 575 days since Captain Asai Shojero of the Japanese torpedo boat Shirakumo had first ordered the attack on the Russian cruiser Palada on the night of February 8, 1904, in the cold, dark waters surrounding Port Arthur. In total, 2.5 million people had taken part in the Russo-Japanese War. 1.3 million from the Russian Empire and 1.2 million from the Empire of Japan. The 18 and a half months of fighting had cost Russia approximately 39.5 billion present-day dollars. Japan had spent around 25 billion, 10 billion of which came from foreign loans. Of those that fought, approximately 131,000 died, 88,000 Japanese and 43,000 Russian of which 70% were killed in action or died of wounds and 30% died from disease. A further 20,000 Chinese civilians also died, bringing the total dead to around 151,000. Exact numbers are difficult to determine given that neither side published official figures. However, Around 170,000 Japanese soldiers were wounded, 200,000 contracted diseases, and over 2,000 became prisoners of war. Around 111,000 Russian soldiers were wounded, 108,000 contracted diseases, and over 79,000 became prisoners of war. In Portsmouth, there was a 19-gun salute. Church bells rang throughout the town, and Kimura and Witta shook hands and went to the dining hall to make a toast to peace. There were not enough glasses, however, and the waiters had to quickly drive to a nearby hotel to collect some. In Russia, Witta was seen as a hero and made a count. His diplomatic maneuvering and the Tsar's stubbornness yielded Russia its only victory of the war. The chairman of Harper's Magazine referred to Witta as the most prominent maker of peace and love and harmony in the civilized world. And on the topic of the treaty, the New York Times wrote, The judgment of all observers here, whether pro-Japanese or pro-Russian, is that the victory is as astonishing a thing as ever was seen in diplomatic history. A nation hopelessly beaten in every battle of the war one army captured and other overwhelmingly routed, with a navy swept from the seas, dictated her own terms to the victors. Despite the diplomatic coup during the peace treaty, the war ended with a de facto Japanese victory and a Russian defeat. Japan had been an isolated feudal kingdom ruled by samurai and the shogun only 37 years earlier. Now, to militarily defeat the second largest world empire meant international recognition and respect. President Roosevelt called Japan a civilized modern power. Following the victory, 
Japanese legations abroad were upgraded to fully-fledged embassies, and by 1911, Japan enjoyed full tariff autonomy. The victory also did much to affirm the role of the military and oligarchy in Japanese society, with a contemporary noting how, Wholesome thought and enterprise are fostered on the battlefield, while the nation's many ills are born of peace. A year later, the Japanese philosopher Okaura Kakuzo would write, The average Westerner was to regard Japan as barbarous while she indulged in the gentle arts of peace. He calls her civilized since she began to commit wholesale slaughter on Manchurian battlefields. For Tsarist Russia, the defeat was seen by many as evidence of the corrupt nature of the autocracy. The Polish-British writer Joseph Conrad wrote, Never before had the Western world the opportunity to look so deep into the black abyss which separates a soulless autocracy posing as, and even believing itself to be, the arbiter of Europe from its benighted, starved souls of its people. With the legitimacy of the regime in question, thoughts of revolution persisted. Referring to the events of 1905, Sergei Witte stated, All this is trifling compared with what is going to happen one of these days. The future communist revolutionary Vladimir Lenin concluded that The capitulation of Port Arthur was the prologue to the capitulation of Tsarism. The war also represented the increasingly globalized world, as the future Polish-German socialist revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg described in May 1904. The Russo-Japanese War now gives to all an awareness that even war and peace in Europe, its destiny, is not decided between the four walls of the European court, but outside it, in the gigantic maelstrom of world and colonial politics. Later, the future marshal of the Second Polish Republic, Joseph Pilsudski, would award the Virtuti Militari, Poland's highest military honor, to 51 Japanese officers. The American missionary, Sidney Gulick, believed that the Russo-Japanese War marks an era in the history of the Far East and of the world. For now begins a readjustment of the balance of power among nations, a readjustment which promises to halt the territorial expansion of white races and to check their racial pride. The British attaché, Ian Hamilton, wrote of Asia advancing, Europe falling back. And another observer referred to The victory of a non-white people over a white people is the most important event which has happened or is likely to happen in our lifetime. The Vietnamese independence activist Phan Bo Chao described how the Japanese victory opened up a new world. Sun Yat-sen, the future first president of China, was sailing through the Suez Canal when he saw a ship with wounded Russian soldiers. An onlooker mistakenly asked if Sun was Japanese, with Sun describing the joy of this Arab as the son of a great Asian race was unbounded. An Indian nationalist poet wrote, Japan, thy magnanimity like wildfire spread, the proudest European powers thee now dread, thou amazed all, all nations, thee the world adores. Magnanimous Japan, thy praise like a torrent pours. A British observer in India wrote how A stir of excitement passed over India. Even the remote villagers talked over the victories of Japan. The future first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, 
described how the Japanese victory helped relieve the feeling of inferiority from which we all suffered, and that Japanese victories stirred up my enthusiasm. Nationalistic ideas filled my head. I mused on Indian freedom and Asiatic freedom from the thraldom of Europe. The peace also signified the growing role of the United States in Asian and Pacific affairs and the personal influence of Theodore Roosevelt. The president was described by Henry Adams as the best herder of emperors since Napoleon. Roosevelt would be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize the following year in 1906. In reference to peace, Roosevelt concluded, it's a mighty good thing for Russia, and a mighty good thing for Japan, and a mighty good thing for me too. Back in Manchuria, a Russian photographer wrote, I would not say that active troops were very excited at the news of peace. One could hear neither music nor shouts of hurrah anywhere. Everybody felt dissatisfaction. Everybody was oppressed with the thought of fruitless casualties and labors, which meant to us not glory, but nearly disgrace. The Japanese delegates returned home on a somber note. However, despite the lack of an indemnity, the military and civilian leaders were relieved that the war had ended. Just as the economy seemed to be at a breaking point, Japan had gained an honorable victory, and Korea was now securely within the Japanese sphere of influence. These feelings of relief were not shared by a large number of the population. The Anti-Russian League, which had helped draw support for the war, was now distributing pamphlets calling the events of Portsmouth humiliating. Just as in 1895, when the Russian, French, and German intervention in the aftermath of the Sino-Japanese War had denied the Japanese the Laodong Peninsula, many saw the treaty and the conduct of the United States as cynical meddling which prevented Japan from gaining justly earned reparations and the Portsmouth Peace as a diplomatic surrender in spite of military victory. This discontent manifested on September 5th, 1905, the day of the treaty signing. In the stifling 35 degree heat, 30,000 people gathered in Hibaya Park in Tokyo. The anti-peace and anti-government demonstration in which Children swam and went fishing in the moat around the imperial palace as a sign of disrespect, turned into a riot as members of the crowd drew swords and the police were overwhelmed. During a night of violence against government authority, the crowds marched towards the imperial palace as 70% of police boxes in the city, 13 churches, 53 homes, and 15 trams were burnt down. Protests took place outside the American legation, which had to be defended by 400 troops. The interior minister's house was attacked, and a newly built statue of Ito Hirobumi, the president of the Privy Council, was torn down and dragged through the streets. The newspaper Nichi Nichi called the treaty an insult to the nation. The Nippon, the bitterest dose the nation has ever been compelled to take. The publishers Kokumen took a moderate stance and were burned down for their complacency. By the following night, 17 people had died, 450 policemen and 50 firemen had been injured, and over 2,000 arrests had been made. Eventually, the riots were brought to a close by heavy rain and the government issuing martial law, which would last until November 29th. The fallout of the upheaval and the discontent of the masses 
would eventually lead to the collapse of the Katsura cabinet in January 1906. The feeling of crisis following peace was compounded on September 11, 1905, when, less than a week after the treaty had been signed, at 12.30 a.m., a massive explosion ripped through the Japanese flagship, the Mikasa, in Sasebo. The Mikasa, which had led the Japanese Navy to victory, was now below the waves while 300 sailors lost their lives. More deaths than had been suffered by Japan during the Battle of Tsushima. The exact cause of the fire and subsequent exploding magazine is unknown. Some speculated a connection with the protests. However, it was more likely the result of either drunk or careless sailors. Togo was on board only a few hours earlier and narrowly missed going down with his ship on account of having to visit the emperor. In a gesture of respect, Admiral Rozhetsvinsky sent a telegram of condolence to Togo following the loss of his capital ship. On December 15, 1905, Japanese prisoners of war held by the Russian government were formally handed over to the Japanese government. While popular discontent had begun in Japan, it had not ended in Russia. The Russo-Japanese War was not the major cause of revolution in Russia. Imperial Russia was around the fourth largest industrial power in the world and Europe's largest agricultural producer, yet Russian GDP per capita was only 20% of Britain's and 40% of Germany's. In 1878, the average lifespan for a Russian subject was 30 years, compared to the German 49, Japanese 51, and British 52. And during the reign of Tsar Nicholas II, the percentage of the population who could read and write stood at around 30%. A testament to the role of the autocracy was that by 1903, only 30% of Russian army regimental commanders and 50% of divisional commanders had graduated from an advanced military academy. As well as the low living standards of the peasants and working classes, mass discontent was further fueled by ethnic tensions throughout the empire and an increasingly radicalized intelligentsia. The defeat by Japan served as the major catalyst for discontent and acutely demonstrated the failures of the czarist state to the people. Many Russian statesmen had hoped that peace would satisfy and unite the population. This was not the case. Count Kokovstov wrote that the hostilities were much too far removed from us. The war was too feebly reflected in everyday life. The Baltic region was in an uproar, and even at the threshold of St. Petersburg, attacks upon the police and the army became increasingly common. Over one million men remained in Manchuria and were unable to help police the state. It took months for the troops to return home, and huge, cramped bottlenecks occurred on the railways, where discontent was allowed to spread unabated. On February 19, 1906, the Russian prisoners of war held by the Japanese government were formally handed over to the Russian government. In the year 1900, in the Russian Empire, Military troops were called to restore order 29 times. Within the first 10 months of 1905, that number had increased to 2,699. Within five days from October 8, 1905, over a million workers took part in an empire-wide strike, over twice as many as in response to Bloody Sunday, 
and telegraphs and trains came to a standstill throughout the country. On October 13th, a Soviet, or Council, was established in St. Petersburg, where the future revolutionary Leon Trotsky headed the Soviet's Strike Coordinating Committee for two weeks. On October 14th, there were warnings of a crackdown. The next day, St. Petersburg University was closed. Initially, Tsar Nicholas wished to establish a reactionary military dictatorship headed by his cousin, Grand Duke Nicholas Nikolaevich. However, Nikolaevich refused the position and threatened to shoot himself if the Tsar did not yield to the moderates. Many in the Romanov inner circle, such as Sergei Witta, urged Nicholas to make political concessions. Eventually, he did so with the October Manifesto. Published on October 30th, 1905, the October Manifesto was a declaration from the Tsar promising political and civil rights to the people. It promised the development of a Russian constitution and the establishment of a Duma, a parliament. Following the announcement, which pacified many moderates, the government responded to the disorder. In 1908, when later questioned on the political changes to Tsarism, Sergei Witta supposedly replied, I have a constitution in my head, but as to my heart. At which point, he spat on the ground. Coordinating the regime's response to events would be Pyotr Dernovo, the interior minister. Dernovo was born in Moscow to a noble Russian family in 1845 and graduated from the Imperial Naval School and then the Law Academy. He served in the Navy throughout the 1860s and then left the military to serve as a prosecutor in Kiev. In 1881, he moved into the police force and, between 1884 and 1893, was director of police. Dornovo was forced to resign, however, when he used his police powers to break into the apartment of a Brazilian diplomat who was exchanging letters with his mistress. When the issue was brought to the attention of Tsar Alexander III, he supposedly said, Get rid of this swine within 24 hours. Dornovo then went into political exile abroad until 1894, when the Tsar suddenly died from illness. Dornovo was then able to return to Russia and resume his career. Eventually, he achieved the rank of Deputy Interior Minister by 1900. He was a policeman in his thoughts and actions, and in 1904, he called the war with Japan senseless, stating it was a naive idea to fix internal disorder with a foreign success. In the face of growing disorder, following peace with Japan, Dornovo was appointed acting interior minister by Sergei Witta and entrusted with saving Tsarism from revolution. He proved to be up to the task. Within days of his appointment, sailors in the Baltic mutinied. Dornovo responded with hundreds of executions and crushed the mutiny. Following Dornovo's appointment, one top Okranka official stated, Everyone started to work. The machinery went into high gear. Arrests began. Employing over 300,000 troops, in addition to the police and Okranka, during the following weeks, there were as many as 70,000 arrests. Dornovo sacked incompetent governors and made the rest take back public spaces. In mid-November 1905, he broke a strike of mail and telegraph workers by organizing replacement staff. On December 3rd, the St. Petersburg Soviet told workers to withdraw their money from state banks. Dornovo then had 260 members of the Soviet arrested 
including Chairman Trotsky. He reported directly to the Tsar and refused to consult the government. Durnovo, the interior minister, acts superbly, wrote Nicholas. On December 7th, there was an uprising in Moscow. Durnovo ordered it crushed. 424 were killed and 2,000 wounded. To ministers in Kiev, he wrote, I earnestly request in this and similar cases that you order the use of armed force without the slightest leniency and that insurgents be annihilated and their homes burned under the present circumstances the restoration of the authority of the government is possible only by these means. On May 10th, 1906, the first Duma was convened and the Russian constitution founded. The Duma representatives attempted to secure official political rights, particularly over finance, and to limit the Tsar's power over legislation. However, the session became deadlocked, and after just over two months, on July 21st, Tsar Nicholas dissolved the Duma. A second Duma met the following year, on March 5th, 1907, but this too lasted only a short time until June 16th, when it was dissolved. The third Duma would convene that same year, but only after Tsarist electoral reform, which increased representation of the middle class. By October 1st, 1906, Tsar Nicholas restored the autonomy of the Diet of Finland. The Finnish parliament then implemented universal suffrage for both men and women aged 24 and older, and in a first for European history, allowed women to run for office, with 19 winning seats in parliament. Although the Tsar did maintain final say in Finnish politics, on April 16, 1906, Russia was able to secure an international loan of 2.25 billion francs, half of which came from the French government, to offset the economic consequences of the war. By 1907, all peasant and worker opposition had been crushed and the Duma pacified. Vladimir Gurko, Dornovo's deputy, wrote that the regime had tottered on the brink of an abyss. It was saved by Dernovo, who adopted an almost independent policy and by merciless persecution of the revolutionary elements, re-established a certain degree of order in the country. Despite the defeat of opposition forces, one contemporary noted the feeling of many who were still dissatisfied with czarism. Long before the World War, all politically conscious people lived as on a volcano. The war was fought between Russia and Japan, but for the most part, the fighting took place in China. The towns, villages, and cities of Manchuria were shelled, looted, occupied, and became the battlefields of the two powers. During the war, Chinese property would be damaged and destroyed to the tune of 600 million teal, around 8.6 billion present-day dollars. Disease was exacerbated amongst the Chinese population. For instance, during the Battle of Mukden, 8,000 Chinese refugees of the Scottish Presbyterian Mission developed typhus. During times of looting and occupation, both sides showed brutality towards the Chinese civilians. Homes were torn down to supply timber to the armies, and when in retreat, a policy of scorched earth destroyed Chinese infrastructure. China was not just passive, but also played an active role in the war.
Chinese laborers were hired, or coerced, by both sides to construct defenses and move supplies. For instance, Colonel Trechikov at the Battle of Nanshan had 5,000 Chinese laborers help build the defenses. Both sides also relied heavily on Chinese informants. Locals knew the terrain and acquired vital information with their extended, innocuous contact with the belligerent armies. However, many Chinese civilians paid a price for this involvement by a minority. Both sides enacted harsh punishments and brutal reprisals of torture and executions to punish and prevent the civilians from informing the opposing side. At the start of the war, the Russian viceroy Alexeyev proclaimed, Let the people of Manchuria all tremble and obey. Should the Chinese officials and people regard with hatred the Russian forces, the Russian government will certainly exterminate such people without the slightest mercy. And the Japanese leaflets dropped into Port Arthur read, No Chinaman who has in any way assisted the Russians to defend this place will be given quarter. Russian Lieutenant Colonel Panov wrote, Local inhabitants almost totally rejected contacting us because of the high risk and eventual cruel punishments by the Japanese. They further assure us, we cannot say whether it is correct or not, that after the retreat of Russian troops, all the Chinese who had been in Russian pay ought to escape from their villages, or the Japanese would sentence them to death on getting information about their service. The Japanese suspect everybody among the Chinese of espionage to the benefit of the Russians. Chinese involvement also took a political dimension. Geopolitically, the situation was difficult for the Qin Empire. Russian advances could deny previously promised rights in Manchuria. On the other hand, Japan had waged war and defeated the Qin back in 1895, and in the aftermath, imposed an unequal treaty, expelled Chinese influence in Korea, and annexed the Chinese island of Taiwan. From the Russian perspective, a Sino-Japanese alliance seemed possible. Chinese General Ma moved 16,000 troops to the border with Manchuria, and amongst these Chinese troops were a number of Japanese officers. Thomas Sammons of the U.S. Consul in Nuchang reported that they seem at present to fear more the Chinese troops under General Ma and are making preparations to resist them. They claim to believe as certain that they will be attacked by General Ma's troops. Russia's army organization was to consist of 300,000 men to meet the Japanese army and 200,000 to fight the Chinese. There is nothing that they fear so much as a union of forces between Japan and China. However, in reality, Japan wanted to secure the good faith of the United States and Britain and did not pursue an alliance with China, framing the conflict as an imperial dispute between Japan and Russia and not an anti-Western movement, as with the Boxer Uprising in 1900. When the war ended, it would be Chinese territory bargained with by the two powers, with the Japanese lease on the Laodong Peninsula and the Russian transfer of the southern half of the Southern Manchurian Railroad. Both sides also agreed to open up Manchuria to free trade, and Japanese subjects in China were to come under a system of Japanese law and extraterritoriality. Both sides agreed to seek Chinese permission for such developments, but to many, this was a foregone conclusion. By the end of the Russo-Japanese War, 20,000 Chinese people had died, and many more had suffered wounds and had their homes and property destroyed. There were, however, some changes in China. Japan as an Asian nation 
had become the first to defeat a European power in a war, and so many put their hopes in a Japanese-style process of modernization. In 1905, Qin reforms were implemented that allowed the study of foreign constitutions and the rigorous classical imperial civil service examinations, which had begun in the 7th century, were abolished. In August 1905, Sun Yat-sen, the future first president of China, founded the Chinese United League, an anti-Qin revolutionary movement, while living and studying in Tokyo. The number of Chinese students in Tokyo would increase from less than 100 in 1900 to 8,000 in 1905 to more than 15,000 in 1906 which included another future president of China and Chinese leader during World War II, Chiang Kai-shek. Arthur Diozzi, the founder of the British Japan Society, wrote, The whole question of the effect the Russo-Japanese conflict may produce on China is so vast, so fraught with tremendous possibilities affecting the whole world that imagination boggles at it. The war would also have significant implications for the country and people of Korea. Korea had been a unified state since the 14th century under the Joseon dynasty and had retained its independence in the face of two invasions by Japan in 1592 and 1597. However, in 1636, an invasion by the Qin Dynasty resulted in Korea becoming a tributary state following the Japanese victory in the First Sino-Japanese War in 1895. Korea was proclaimed independent, although interference by outside powers still remained and the Korean army only numbered 15,000. On February 9th, 1904, the Battle of Chimulpa Bay saw Japanese Marines occupy Incheon. Soon after, Japanese troops occupied Seoul and Pyongyang. Fighting again took place in Korea during the Battle of the Yalu River in late April. Tens of thousands of Korean laborers were enrolled into the Japanese army as the country was de facto occupied during the war and a number of Korean subjects were arrested and executed on charges of protesting, spying, sabotage, and rebellion. The geopolitical situation of the Korean Peninsula had been a major cause of the hostilities between Russia and Japan, and during the conflict, Japan went about forging closer and closer ties with Korea. From 1904, there were several unequal treaties and agreements imposed on Korea by Japan. On February 23, 1904, a Japan-Korea treaty was concluded that gave Korean consent to the stationing of Japanese troops in the country. It also stated that the security of the Korean royal family would be a Japanese responsibility and that Japanese advisors would be placed into positions of administration. In March 1904, the Korean activist Lee Bom Yoon was able to acquire 1,000 rifles, and on July 7th, 300 Korean guerrillas were mustered to commit numerous acts of sabotage on Japanese targets. A number of Russian cavalry, as many as 3,000, were sent to support the Korean guerrillas. However, with the overwhelming Japanese occupation and the Korean Emperor Gojong being held by the Japanese, large-scale Korean opposition never materialized. Another unequal treaty on August 22, 1904, meant that the Korean government was to appoint financial and diplomatic advisors chosen by the Japanese government, and that Korean officials were to consult with Japanese officials before making any treaties with foreign powers. In 
January 1905, saw the Japanese-backed Seoul Busan Railway completed. April 1, 1905, was the start of another agreement which allowed for a Japanese takeover of all Korean postal, telegraph, and telephone services. On August 6th, the Portsmouth Peace Conference began, and August 14th saw Korea consent, at least officially, following Japanese pressure, to Japanese ships navigating all Korean coastal and inland waters. It was the hope of some Korean officials that the Portsmouth Peace Conference would secure Korean independence. For instance, Syngman Rae, the future first president of South Korea, had lobbied Roosevelt during the talks. Ultimately, however, the cause of Korean independence was unsuccessful. Back in January, Roosevelt had told Secretary of State Hay that we cannot possibly interfere for the Koreans against Japan. They could not strike one blow in their own defense. Throughout 1905, the great powers registered their neutrality in reference to Japanese expansion. Britain with the renewed Anglo-Japanese alliance, the U.S. with the Taft-Katsura Agreement, and Russia with the Treaty of Portsmouth. That same year, the Qin Dynasty, France, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Italy, Belgium, and Denmark severed diplomatic relations with Korea. On November 17, 1905, the Usla Treaty was signed between Korea and Japan. The treaty heavily reduced the Korean army from 20,000 to 1,000 and limited their area of operations to Seoul. Korea also relinquished all sovereignty over the conduct of foreign affairs to Japan, in effect making Korea a Japanese protectorate. The Emperor Gojong cabled the American editor of the Korean-based newspaper, the Korean Review, who in turn was asked to petition Washington. Gojong announced, I declare that the so-called Treaty of Protectorate, recently concluded between Korea and Japan, was extorted at the point of the sword and under duress, and therefore is null and void. I never consented to it, and never will. The U.S. State Department refused to receive the telegram. Emperor Gojong then sent further personal letters to other heads of state, including the British King Edward VII and Wilhelm II of Germany. But, as with the United States, there was no reply. Min Young Hwan, a conservative minister in the Korean government and nephew of the previously assassinated Empress Myung Song, committed suicide in an act of opposition to the Usla Treaty by cutting his own throat. In his pockets were a number of messages and his will. Five messages were directed to the representatives of China, Britain, the U.S., France, and Germany and pleaded for their recognition of Korean sovereignty. The other messages were directed towards the Korean people. They stated the Korean populace should work to restore our freedom and independence. Ito Hirabumi was made Japanese Resident General of Korea on December 21, 1905, and foreign legations began to move from Seoul to Tokyo. A number of Koreans began to rebel, forming what was referred to as the Righteous Army to oppose Japanese rule, and in the following years a guerrilla war would develop. 1906 saw the Japanese Advisory Police Board created in Korea, which, in turn, was given authority over Korean press to examine the draft of each paper or to prohibit the publication if facts were misrepresented or comments made injurious to public peace. October 1906 saw Japan gain economic rights to the forests of the Yalu and Tumen regions. Press control was further tightened, 
with the 1907 newspaper law, which required permission from the Minister of Home Affairs or Police Inspector General, as well as payment before a newspaper could be published in Korea. Between June and October 1907, delegates from around the world met for the Second Hague Conference in the Netherlands. The International Conference was an effort by the great powers to standardize laws of war and pursue disarmament. Still reeling from the Yusla Treaty, Emperor Gojong sent three secret emissaries to the conference, Yi Jun, Yi Sang Sol, and Yi Wei Jong. The delegates were to express the invalidity of the Korea-Japanese treaties and to assert Korean independence to the great powers. However, they were not given permission to enter the convention hall, given that, in the eyes of the powers, Korea was already a protectorate of Japan, and thus was unable to maintain representatives. Yi Jun committed suicide in protest. On July 24, 1907, there was a further treaty that eroded Korean independence. The Japan-Korea Treaty stipulated that the government of Korea shall follow the directions of the resident general in connection with the reform of administration. Korea shall not enact any law or ordinance unless it has previous approval of the resident general. The Korean Emperor Gojong refused to sign, and in addition to his efforts at the Hague Conference, was forced to abdicate by Japanese forces. His son, the now Emperor Sun Jong, then signed the treaty. This led to anti-Japanese demonstrations and renewed offensives by the Righteous Army. Between 1907 and 1910, there were 2,929 clashes between the Japanese military and the Righteous Army. As many as 140,000 Koreans took part in the resistance, of whom 17,688 died. Opposition peaked in 1908, and in the following year, 1909, there was a grand punitive raid, wherein, for 40 days, Japanese forces sought out and crushed insurgent bases, killing or capturing over 2,000 leading members and effectively ending major armed resistance. In 1908, the Japanese Oriental Development Company was established with its headquarters in Seoul. The company was a means to develop infrastructure in Korea to allow for Japanese migration and resource extraction. The following year, July 12, 1909, saw Japan establish full control over the Korean justice system. On October 26, 1909, Ito Hirobumi, the Japanese resident general in Korea, arrived in Harbin to meet with a Russian representative. After passing the Russian guards on the railway platform, a Christian Korean nationalist, An Jung-gyun, shot Ito three times in the chest. Ito died soon after. An or Thomas, his baptismal name, was arrested by the Russian guards and handed over to Japanese authorities two days later. In reference to the assassination, he stated, I have ventured to commit a serious crime, offering my life for my country. This is the behavior of a noble-minded patriot. In the aftermath of his trial, he was sentenced to death. On requested to be executed by firing squad as a prisoner of war. Instead, he was hung as a criminal. Ito Hirobumi was seen by many as a light-handed resident general. Following his assassination in 1909, Masataki Terauchi, the Japanese army minister, was appointed resident general, and a more hard-line approach was adopted. In 1910, the Japanese-controlled English newspaper, the Seoul Press, stated, The present requires the wielding of an iron hand rather than a gloved one in order to secure lasting peace and order. 
Japan must be prepared to sacrifice anybody who offers obstacles to her work. Japan had hitherto dealt with Korean malcontent in a lenient way. She has learned from experience, gained during the past five years, that there are some persons who cannot be converted by conciliatory methods. There is but one way to deal with these people, and that is by stern and relentless means. By 1910, 8% of arable land in Korea was Japanese-owned, and on February 20th, the New York Times published. Though nothing official can be learned to confirm the reports that negotiations for the annexation of Korea by Japan are now proceeding, many signs indicate that annexation is imminent. Long conferences between officials are constantly in progress. Visits are frequently interchanged and great activity is noticed in the Japanese offices. The censorship has been placed on an even more rigid basis than before, and Tokyo newspapers containing reports on the situation in Korea are confiscated at Busan upon their arrival in this country. The entire country has been placed under a strong military guard, and a number of Japanese war vessels are now patrolling the coast of Korea. The situation indicates conditions of extreme tension, but officials maintain a sphinx-like attitude, refusing to make any statement regarding annexation. On August 1st, the Korean military was officially dissolved. The editor of the Tokyo Yorozu wrote, How shall we dispose of our surplus millions? Our small country can hardly find room within its narrow boundaries to accommodate its yearly increase of half a million people. We cannot kill them wholesale, nor can we fill up the Sea of Japan and make dry land of it for them to settle on. We would like to go to Kansas, where we could escape starvation, but however hospitable America may be, she refuses to receive so many newcomers all at once. Australia is a white man's land, and no colored people are admitted there. We know that Korea is thickly populated, but there the least resistance is offered. And so, we go there, just as Englishmen went to America and Australia and elsewhere, forcing the natives to make room for them. Finally, on August 22, 1910, the Japan-Korea Annexation Treaty was signed, in which... His Majesty the Emperor of Korea makes complete and permanent secession to His Majesty the Emperor of Japan of all rights of sovereignty over the whole of Korea. Given the Japanese military occupation of Korea since the war with Russia, the legality of the treaty was disputed by some. However, the reality on the ground reflected a defeated Korea, Japanese strength, and great power indifference. On August 29th, the Korean Emperor Sun Jung was forced to abdicate and Korea was annexed into the Japanese Empire. During the Great Victory Parade through Tokyo in 1905, on the way to a reception held by the Emperor Meiji, General Nogi Marusuka rode an old mare in place of a carriage and wore the same uniform he had worn during the war in place of ceremonial attire. As he made his final report of the war's events, tears ran down the old general's face and once finished, he asked for permission to die. If your excellency wishes to die, wait until I am gone replied the emperor. Nogi lived out the rest of his days as the principal of a Tokyo middle school for Japan's nobility, even mentoring the young prince Hirohito. Nogi would campaign for the Japanese Boy Scouts and donate the majority of his fortune to hospitals for the war's wounded and monuments to the war's dead. On the night of July 29th, 1912, the Japanese Emperor Meiji died of natural causes. On the night of September 12th, the day before the Emperor's funeral, 
Nogi Marusuka groomed his horses for a final time and wrote ten letters to friends, family, and government officials. I am now going to kill myself and follow my emperor. Pardon me, please. Ever since losing my regimental flag in the Civil War, I have always intended to sacrifice myself. The following day, September 13th, as the hearse carrying the emperor's body left the palace, Nogi Marasuka and Nogi Shizuko committed ritual suicide. Her death poem read, Having heard that, once departed, there is no day of return. How sad it is to encounter today the royal procession. Seven years earlier, General Nogi made the following address during the siege of Port Arthur. My heart is oppressed with sadness when I think of all you who have paid the price of victory and whose spirits are in the great hereafter.